very important for us to show to Canada, show the world uh, what's the, per the real value of Italian products. So uh, it's, it's not only you know, a production business and consuming, it's just there's a story here. There's uh, tra the traditions, uh, culture, because every product came And uh, yeah, it's incredible that we can protect this. We have, uh, e e we can uh, uh, not only like continuing doing this in Italy, but also share with the world, with our friends in the world, this um, amazing product. And uh, yeah, that the fact that they are available all around the world, come on, it's really incredible. And they are made uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the same uh, procedure that were made, uh, always been made in, the, in, in history. And uh, yeah, this is the most important thing about that. Uh, you, have it, you have it available, it's good for the consumer, and everyone, of course, is free to choose if to buy this or, or buy another product, but it's there, it's here. This is a piece of Italy, and I hope you're gonna enjoy this. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you, Benedetto. I mean, um, before I start to talk about uh, uh, Italian products, I would like to say that uh, the last three years that the world has gone through and previous to that uh, a very bad uh, uh, earthquake in some regions of Italy that they produce some of these products has put them in very serious difficulties. Uh, ourselves, uh, we are ambassadors of Italian, Italian products for a simple reason, because they are good. I would not be here, I would not be here to, to talk about these products if I did not believe that they are ethically uh, produced properly and they are very good. Uh, there is a systematic uh, work that is done underground by all the Italian embassies, the Italian trade commissioners, and all the single people. Today I was very amazed to go to the Nicastro store and find out that he's a very, is exactly 10 kilometers away, his family, for where I come from. And makes me so happy to see the best of the best of Italy. And uh, whatever we talk tonight, I was mentioning to some people, Italian food uh, uh, differentiates some from other, other foods because it's a food of joviality, of happiness, and inclusivity. I have brought tonight one of my assistants that um, I did not need him. I just brought him in because I want to include, he's going to be eventually one of the ambassadors of, of the Italian food because, and I sponsor him, he came from India, and he is learning even the Italian language and is le learning the Italian products. Um, Tonight we're going to talk about some ingredients that uh, they've been very important, uh, recognized, importantly recognized by the Italian uh, community. 1985 and 1996, they've been very, very important years where these, uh, uh, they introduced uh, DOP, the Origine Protetta, and IGP, Indicazione Geografica Tipica, so sounds very, but it, it guarantees the, not only the control on the producers, but it guarantees as well what we buy. The quality, the provenience, the sustainability, the amount of salt. Because if, if they don't follow certain parameters that a salumi or a salami needs between one and three percent grams of salt per kilograms, they will not pass this very, very, very strict requirement of the European community. So this is essentially you have a face, a family, a tradition behind all these products that they stand by the products, 
they are anchored in to the tradition because tradition is what we are, but they are projected in the future. So that's the evolution part that um, Benedetto was mentioning. Uh, there are new technologies, but the way to, for example, uh, let me give you an example about this uh, ship's milk cheese. I picked this ship's milk cheese uh, from Crotone. I am from Calabria, but Crotone is a bit far away. It's called Canestrato because it has these uh, particular uh, marks. They use straw containers to press the cheese. You see these marks? That's why it's called Canestrato. So these people, they continue to do what the tradition used to do. I don't know if you're familiar, but 21 days cycle is required with ships to eat uh, freely in grass and after 21 days they have to move them. The reason why is because if they don't move within the 21 days there is some bacteria that they grow where they had the pasture because they, they you know, they, they had the fecal excrement part and eating it, no, no, they will kill the ships. That's how bad there is. Then there is um, uh, clover included in the grass that they eat. Clover has uh, a sanitation, has an antibacterial uh, and a flavor element that gives. So this is, this is the kind of products we're dealing. So there, it seems like uh, uh, when we go to the store, we, picked up, we pick up something, but there is a full tradition, there is a full uh, hard work of a team of females, males, kids, grandkids, grandfathers, that they keep doing this. As well, uh, is Italy the only place that produces a great product? No. I know some amazing producers of cheeses in Quebec that I use them in my restaurant. I am not ashamed, or even in Salt Spring Island, where I'm very close to my, my home. But um, it's growing. And it's a tradition that came from Europe. It's a tradition that started in certain situations with the monks, and then it was uh, given to people that they make their own and they made the evolution. So today I strolled around the market area, and I said, uh, let's make something interesting. Uh, so today it's not about me talking and you guys listening, but it's about working together, have a symbiotic relationship. And please uh, stop me anytime you want. Um, ask me any questions you want. But, you know, we're going to work together. So charcuterie or tavola di affettati. Charcuterie is the French terminology to indicate a variety of cold cuts. Uh, tavola di affettati is uh, the Italian way, and uh, we have to start with uh, differentiate. Uh, what is the difference between this and this? Why we call them salumi? Why we call them salami? To make it very simple, anything that is in, enclosed in a, in a casing, it's called salami. Salsiccia is salami. So uh, any big piece of meat that is dried, cured and dried without enclosing it in any kind of uh, casing, it's, it's called salumi. Okay? We pick today uh, a beautiful uh, uh, prosciutto San Daniele. San Daniele is a little town in uh, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia. He has the microclimate perfect for these uh, pigs that they pasture freely for a certain time of, uh, of the year. And they have to meet certain standards of a weight. Prosciutto di Parma is a great, great prosciutto, but they use smaller pigs that they can be even of provenience from other regions. Uh, prosciutto San Daniele exclusively uses pigs from San Daniele and the very close areas, okay? Uh, 
So this, it's called Milano Salami, but um, this type of salami, uh, it can be, you, you go to a store and say, or you say Milano Salami, and then you say Genoa Salami. What is the difference? Essentially, no difference. It depends on which area is done, and because uh, this type of salami is not controlled by the European community, uh, it can be produced vastly in all Italian uh, territory without any, any control. Of course, there are some people that they make a better, a better salami than others, and they better standards. Uh, this one, it, it, look, it can be, look, it look like a salsiccia, but it's also known as a cacciatore. Cacciatore is a cheese that used to be used by the hunters, and they used to put in their bags because of the size, and have a little snack when they were going for hunting. So that's, that's the name of cacciatore. But cacciatore, again, is a cheese that vastly is controlled uh, uh, in all the territory, and it can be produced from Sicily to Valle d'Aosta. So there is no limitation for that. Uh, going to, uh, we have the Bresaola. Yes, Bresaola is here. Just for clarifying, Milano, it can be used beef and pork at the same time. Cacciatore is done only with pork, okay? And uh, so Bresaola, Bresaola is a dry-aged beef that comes from the Valtellina area. Valtellina is uh, in Lombardy, uh, not too far away from Milano. In Provincia di Sondrio, Sondrio province, they produce this beautiful um, uh, dry-aged beef using the eye of round. Some people use wine, some people use um, different spices, of course. Um, but the most important part is that it needs to be having minimum of 4% of salt per kilogram and needs to be aged at least four months. Now, the perfect charcuterie, if you're entertaining at home, is the best way to prepare a nice board. And I, I went to the market and I got some mission figs, some nice apricot. These strawberries, they were looking great. And I got some uh, pickled uh, rams. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I learned, I've been in Canada now for long, as you see, I'm Italian-Canadian, I'm very proud of being. And uh, when, uh, I, I think it was 2017, Canada had 150 years celebration as a country. And I was chosen to do a dinner for the Italian president that came to Vancouver. And the most important part that I did for a very and by the way, he's an amazing guy. I, I was, as a politician, I won't say it. Honestly, he's a super, super nice guy. This is why he got re-elected, because he's, he's, he's a truly a, 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 a person for the people. So I included some of the ingredients, Canadian ingredients, like I, I did a cured sockai salmon at the time, and many other things, with Italian flair. And he was extremely happy to a point that uh, six months later, I received uh, two order of nights of, uh, from him. And uh, it made me very proud. I'm still waiting for the horse, but the horse never came with it. <laughs> so, uh, of course, in my restaurant, I do more creative, creative cuisine. I'm more, uh, I do a cuisine that is deeply rooted in the territory of British Columbia with Italian flair. There is a gentleman there that was uh, not too long ago, and um, I'm glad to see him here. Thanks for coming. He was in my restaurant two weeks ago. And he, he was very, very suspicious 
of my cooking until I blow him away. So, and it's crazy if I tell you what you're allergic to. I still remember what you're allergic to. No octopus tonight, so no problem. But anyway, so this is the kind of relationship I have with my customers. I, I, I have an open kitchen. I go and talk. So I do lots of talking, but lots of cooking. Good job, don't you think? All right, so let's start. Um, one of my favorite ways to present Brezaola, it's very simple and very delicious. Todd, do we have the salt and, and pepper shakers? Can you find it? Uh, Well, actually, we can do a bigger one. So, everybody's opening it. And I give you a little hint because I do wine list as well in my restaurant. Everybody thinks charcuterie and cheese is the best matches with uh, red wine. But try sparkling or champagne or prosecco and try white wine and see how brightens the flavor and cleans the palate as well so you have a mixing bowl can i have it so we're going to do how many people had uh, strawberries with balsamico and ice cream. See that? Lots of people. In Italy, a good drop of balsamic vinegar is appreciated on strawberry or even in Parmigiano Reggiano. What I do, I take those uh, strawberries and marinate them with a bit of black pepper. Very little salt because there is salt in the bresaola. Some very good amount of olive oil. I didn't know there was no spout there, so I've got to drink it afterwards. And let it macerate for a while, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Then, only olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, only. Only, I, I in my restaurant, uh, how many type of olive oil do you think we have in my restaurant? The extra virgin olive oil. So we got 50 different extra virgin olive oil because every dish uh, I use a different application of olive oil. So, and even when uh, I use a, um, canola oil for the deep fryer, but even when I saute stuff, I use a, a kind of extra virgin olive oil. So don't be shy to put some of this condiment. So, if you put a little goat cheese, it will bring it to a different level. If you put a little bit of arucola, roquette, with some chef parmigiano, you have one of the healthiest and most beautiful appetizers. But there is an affinity. The reason why we serve prosciutto and melone in Italy is because we want to tame down the amount of salt eventually that you find in the prosciutto. So the fruit, the sweet element is always most, most important. That's why I went to the market to buy some of these. So, so these ones are called taralli. They are pretty much like a breadstick but different shape. Uh, they are made uh, uh, with uh, 
sometime durum wheat, uh, but most of the time is uh, regular all purpose flour, some uh, white wine, olive oil, and uh, fennel seeds. So, you guys can see. No, okay, so good job. That's why you're here. You have to go around. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So think about it. If you have a, a nice garden at home, you can put a little chervil, a little rucola, a little watercress, and some of these cheeses that we will get into it, that they will work perfectly with it. So let's go and start to talk while we continue to prepare stuff. So, in Italia, picante means spicy, dolce means sweet. When we find it related to cheeses, the difference is between gorgonzola dolce and gorgonzola picante is because gorgonzola picante is more aged, so that's why. So it's not, and it becomes spicy because of the aging. Eliminating, eliminating some of the moisture, it will concentrate uh, the green cultural things that you find in gorgonzola that gives that strong flavor. So this, this part here, the one you have in your hand, uh, is, so let's start again. This one is sheep's milk, pecorino crotonese, okay? So, this one is provolone piccante. So let me show you, okay? If you open here, this is provolone piccante, this is parmigiano reggiano, and this is asiago. Okay, so provolone piccante, asiago, parmigiano reggiano, and this one is pecorino crotonese. So, provolone piccante, pecorino crotonese, parmigiano reggiano, and this one is asiago. Okay, I'll, I'll go through. So, pecorino is this one. So, Pecorino, Parmigiano, Asiago, and this one is, uh, is uh, Provolone Piccante. So, we're going to work on an integration of cheeses with salumi and salami. I give you a hint. If you have something that is, in the terms of salami, aged and salty, you don't want to put a provolone picante with that because it adds more salt. And then, you know, one of the things I do when I have overripe fruits, I do a combination of these fruits with balsamic vinegar, some red wine and sugar, and cook it down and make almost like a, a compote, a chutney. But it's made with balsamic Italian style, so, and you can use it. So I'm going to show you the integration that works amazingly with So inside here you have uh, sun-dried tomatoes, artichokes, hearts, and marinated olives. What I do with the 
sun-dried tomatoes, I soak them a bit in olive oil to make sure that they tame down the, the salt a bit and gives more flavor. How many people know the difference between nitrite and nitrate? Okay, so nitrate is a natural preservative that normally you find in nature and you find especially in uh, sea salt. For the longest time, people in Italy thought that using cave salt was the best way to do it, but actually the sea salt has this natural preservative. Nitrite, those are very dangerous. Very dangerous because they need to be controlled between 1 and 3%. Um, they are chemical man-made, and uh, if eaten, this is why when you go to places uh, and you're, you should look always for no nitrate, Nitrite, sorry. No nitrite for my kids, always I buy stuff with no nitrite because uh, gastrointestinal and esophagus are uh, very sensitive to that and with the acid they can free some uh, free radicals and it's quite dangerous for, for cancer. So nitrite is something that we should avoid. So when I make my own salumi at, at the restaurant, the nitrite are not existing, I always put... And, Health inspector is very happy as well with that. So, I was mentioning, oh, that's, that, look how beautiful this one. So, this is, there is a difference in Italian between prosciutto cotto and of course prosciutto crudo. The prosciutto part indicates the leg the best part behind of the leg. If it says spalla, it means it's the shoulder. So that's the most prestigious part. This one is being cooked. This one is being cured. Now, this one, they went very fancy, and they put some truffle in it. So we're going to do something very interesting with this. And you can try it at home. Um, Rovagnati is one of the best producers of uh, prosciutto. And it's one of the first ones who eliminated those nitrites and eliminate all those polyphosphates that they are very dangerous for the health. So I'm going to do... something very interesting with this. So we're going to do a little uh, salad of uh, this prosciutto, cotto, with truffles. And this one is Asiago Pressato. You see it has some holes. Uh, it's a cow milk uh, cheese that is made uh, in the Asiago area. Asiago is in Provincia di Treviso. So it's common to find this Asiago between uh, Veneto and Trentino Alto Adige. And uh, they say that it's very similar to Gruyere because of the hole, but it's totally different way. I think I actually a lot, like a lot this one. So, pressato means that this cheese is being pressed to eliminate some of the water between the zero and three months of the, of, the, of the shelf life, right? So, you remember I said it's, it should be wise to try the cheese that you're going to use? And don't be shy to try it with a glass of wine and then you pick what you like.
So, I'm going to reuse the olive oil because I don't like to waste it. Now, because here it's very nice and uh, balanced and sweet in a way, I like to use a breadstick with a bit of chili pepper. So, thank you, Gurjot. Yes. The cheese is the Asiago, sir. Asiago pressato. Anybody has an, any questions at all? No questions? Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm going to show you one right now. Yes. So, my opinion is how many times you guys cook at home and you want to make sure that your guest tests every dish. So, if you put everything assembled in the same thing and is not properly prepared and separated, there is no justice for the products to taste it the way it's supposed to be tasted. So, to me, I don't dislike charcuterie board, but I like to highlight even ingredients at the best of the opportunity and possibility they can give to the guests. That's very important. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a way to do it, and I do a natural separation within the plate so people can taste, actually, the garnish with it. So. so last night, normally my, my two days off are Sundays and Mondays. So last night we worked until big rush. It was busy like crazy around 8:30. So 8:30, I looked at him. I said, "We gotta go." And the rest of the kitchen said, "Where are you guys going?" I said, "Well, we gotta go." So, <laughs> so we 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 left about 11:50. It was late the plane, and we arrived this morning here. So, uh, to me, uh, sharing my time away from my family it's very important, and I like to thank. Uh, Todd and uh, Shannon and the whole crew of volunteers that they have done so much work to do this because without you guys uh, this, this cultural transmission of uh, tradition does not happen so thank you very much thank you so another thing that I like to do when I when I slice cheese and I put on the plate, I like to leave the rind for a simple reason. That indicates what kind of cheese it is. If you cut it, it's very similar. You see, if you will cut this one and this one, because of the aging, it will be very similar. But one is a pecorino, a sheep's milk, and one is a parmigiano.
So one of the reason uh, why, for example, I like to cut this kind of uh, cold cuts by hand because I can control better. You see, they're quite thin, but with the knife, it tastes better than the machine. The prosciutto, unless you learn that you have the proper uh, uh, utensil that you set it down and you put it there, so. So you have a, a cheese that is uh, very dear to me. It's uh, buffalo mozzarella. Uh, living in North America, very, very often we think of the buffalo of the bison. This is actually water buffalo. Water buffalo came from China or India very long ago, and they found very fertile environment in south of Italy, from Latina going all the way down to Campania. Uh, this particular one is produced in Mondragone, Provincia di Caserta in Campania, and it's uh, a cheese that has uh, the DOP control. So, again, when you cut mozzarella, because it's very milk inside, if you cut it too thin, it will bleed. So if you're preparing something for your guests to enjoy in a charcuterie plate, Cut the cheese at last moment. Don't cut it too thin, but cut it like so. You see? If very often they cut it like this, and even in restaurants, and they make it so thin that it bleeds out that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any flavor. So we're gonna do some of these pickles here. And you notice the pickles, I put it next to the mozzarella di bufala, which is the mildest of the cheese. So keep in mind what I was saying, using the fruits, using the, the, the garnish, try to put the mildest with the strongest flavor. So this pickle is quite strong with vinegar, put it next to the mozzarella, it will cut the fat. So this is a, normal things that most likely all of you do when you do cooking, but you have to apply it as well to the, to the charcuterie board. So we, we're doing this. Now we have to put a little bit of prosciutto. Always quality check. And now we're gonna finish it with the Milano salami. Here we go.
How is everyone enjoying the? What's your favorite? What's your favorite on the, on the, in the whole? The picante. That's really good, isn't it? Now think about provolone picante. Everybody knows how to make cacio e pepe. Cacio e pepe stands for uh, cacio is cheese and pepe is pepper. Very simple. Uh, we use pecorino romano normally in that, but that, that particular provolone picante will be amazing. Or if you make it now, right now is the pest, pesto season, when you start to make pesto, beside Parmigiano Reggiano, grate some of this one and you will see how delicious. Okay, so let's talk about truffles. The, the lady, she asked me a question. Truffles from Italy versus truffles from France. So, I am the largest consumer of imported truffles in Canada. <laughs> I'm not bragging, it's the truth. I am, I am, I am part of the Confraternita del Tartufo. I've been serving truffles all my life. I do not serve summer truffles. Those ones, let me show you a difference. You see this one and this one? The difference? This one is a summer truffle. This one is a winter truffle. In the summer truffle, I do not use summer truffles because they taste like sawdust. Cardboard. They are no good. So, from September on, the white truffles from Alba, they grow. So, the white truffles, the Latin name is a tuber magnatum pico, indicates a truffle that is more discernible with the smell rather than the taste. The white truffle is all about the smell. So when you use white truffles, you shave them on top, you don't cook them. So from September to December, we got the white truffles from Alba. Then December on, you get the black truffles. The one that you refer from friends, they are called tuber melanosporum. Tuber is like a potato that grows inside. Tuber melanosporum. The tuber melanosporum grows in Perigord, and then grows as well in Umbria. They're a truffle that is more about taste. So you have to heat it up in order to have the flavor come out. So that's why you apply it. There I have, you see, butter, a little bit of cream is an affinity with white truffle. Anchovies and garlic has affinity with black truffle. Let me give you something very interesting. I am very happy in the summertime to use black truffle from, from Australia. They manage to grow black truffle. It's, it's winter there, so they are winter black truffles, and they are as good as the French one or the Italian ones, the black ones. So really, really good. Oregon truffles, they smell like bed truffles. So I was invited one time, they never invited me again. <laughs> they invited, I speak my mind, I'm sorry. I, I'm like this. So they invited me to do this event. They were super nice and it was awkward. Everybody was bringing dogs, uh, even chihuahuas to pick up the things. And I said, chihuahua to get truffles, I'm, all right. Then I see the truffles. And they say, How, what do you think? I said, they taste like bed truffles. They never invited me again. So, well, pigs, they used to use it, but because they are not trainable, they used to eat them. <laughs> so the dogs, they are trained. So, Lagotto Emiliano is the, is the variety of uh, Emilia Romagna that they use, uh, they use for uh, training for, for these 
So it's quite amazing. Yes. This one? Yes. So, in the terminology sottaceto, in Italian uh, we do. Thank you. In the in the terminology of sottaceto, it means anything pickled under vinegar. It was one of the oldest ways to preserve things. In order to eat them, in, in, you make it in the summer, you eat it in the winter with cold cuts like this. Because I grew up in south of Italy when in December we used to do uh, the celebration of life of the pigs. And we used to make salami and salumi for four days. And I remember I was five and uh, I was asking the, the master guy to do this salami to show me how to do it. My mom said, what are you doing? Why don't you go and play with your people of your age instead of being here? I said, oh, I like this. And she thought I was nuts. She wasn't far off, but you know. <laughs> so the idea of ramps, ramps, whatever you call it, it's like a wild onion, a wild, you know. Uh, those ones are treated exactly the same way. They are pickled like you will pickle uh, eggplants or zucchini or carrots, the way we do in Italy. So, but this is a typical Canadian product. And right now is the time of this, is the time of uh, fiddleheads. Actually, it was May because then... So, so many good things that we like to incorporate and make it very different. What's the difference uh, of Italian food in Italy and Italian food here? Uh, because Canada is very, has a wealth of ingredients that if you know how to use it, it will make your cooking even better. So that's what it's all about. Any other questions? Adam. Yes. 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 No, no, I, I mentioned before, you remember what I said, One of, and I give you the recipe, not a word of a lie. When you have uh, overripe fruit, I tell you, uh, I wish you guys come. Next time you come to Vancouver, I'm going to give you a tour of the kitchen, eh? to each one of you. <laughs> tour of the kitchen. I take you in my kitchen. In the back, I have heirloom tomatoes. That people say, oh, why you have it out? They overripe. I say, yeah, then I make the tomato sauce. So I found a way to make it Italian. Chutney is English, British, but... Um, or Indian as well, because of the, of the British, uh, believe it or not, they make some beautiful chutneys. So, but the Italian chutney that I'm trying to do uh, are more reflecting of my tradition. So if I do, let's say, overripe figs, I have a fig tree in my house, and I bring it to the restaurant, and they are overripe, I make a jam. If I want to spice it up, I put some... Uh, Spices like, uh, uh, you know, mustard seeds and stuff like that. And I, I incorporate a little bit of balsamic vinegar that gives that little oomph and helps to preserve. You know, when you make chutney, you have to have correttore di acidità, something that helps to preserve. And people use ascorbic acid. Well, you don't need that with the vinegar. The vinegar is a natural preservative. So, yes, I... I make a chocolate chutney that is to die for. And I serve it with, I, this week I made it, I show them uh, how to make, uh, uh, I make some uh, licorice biscotti, but not leaven, without any, any yeast, because I want to use it for the charcuterie board, and I make one with, what was ginger and, let's see if you remember. One was licorice, another one? Ginger and fennel. No. <laughs> ginger and coffee. 
You had six, so you should remember. He eats six of them, so. Ginger and coffee. And what I do, I didn't, you know, normally you use a combination of uh, uh, baking powder and baking soda to make sure that they become more friable. This one I want a little bit harder, so they go great with that, so. Please. Okay. You guys have five hours? <laughs> I tell you what it is. I, I was growing up in south of Italy, and uh, I was, was going to school very diligently and uh, won two scholarships, did two years of medical school, but in the summer I was working in restaurants. The day I went to see dialysis as part of the physics program of the school in, the, in medical school, I, I said to my mom, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. And she thought I was nuts. And, and I said, no, I want to see people happy. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to join my brother in Toronto and uh, work in his restaurant. And she thought, this guy, I have to take him for an assessment. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, no regrets. It's the best choice I've done. Uh, I tell my kids never to be like me or to be themselves, but I tell them it's very important to go to school, at least for, you know what I'm saying, and then you can vary up. Because then when I stop to be... Uh, you know, a doctor to go to a doctor school. I went to take a professorship in uh, in uh, cooking. I was the associated associated professor at, at George Brown College in Toronto because I have this passion inside. When my mom passed away 17 years ago, I was building a private room dedicated to her. And she, by the way, she she is the reason why I have this passion because she was a trained chef. And um, she was unique and amazing, but she didn't want me to have the hardship of being away from the family. The way, like, you know, I'm married for 30 years. I have a wife that she's amazing and supportive. If I tell her, listen, I, it's part of my culture. I have to go in Ottawa and I have to do this for the Ottawa community. She say, yes, go. You know what I'm saying? So. Uh, but what I do in exchange, I was telling Todd, I said, I, I, if I can change the, 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 the flight from 6 o'clock tomorrow night, I, I change at 6 o'clock in the morning, that gives me the chance to go and spend time with the family because on Tuesday I go back to work. Two weeks ago, I, want, I went to do a fundraising uh, dinner for uh, Sherbrook Hospital in Toronto. I flew again on Sunday, did the dinner on Monday. Tuesday, I flew back and went to work. So, um, I was saying, when, I, when, I, when she passed, I, I went to Italy, and I went through the stuff that she had. This, you see, you ask me why I have three, three rings. One is hers. She left it for me in this, she left it for me in this little case. And when I went there, it broke my heart because she saved national newspapers that I qualified as a student, number three in Italy, one time, and number six. And I say, I, 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 was, I, was, I was thinking that I disappointed her. But then I think that uh, she's, she's happy that I'm happy. So, so what I say, ultimately, I have my, what, two of my kids that they work with me at the restaurant. Uh, it's a family business. My, my brother works with me. My nephew works with me. They become part of the family too because uh, they are family. I don't treat them as uh, employees, but I treat them as a part of the family. And you can contradict me <laughs> if I'm lying because I, that's one thing I do. That I don't do. I don't do right. So, so, and uh, you know, it's my kids. They work there. My daughter, she's very strong in the back. 
My son still is 29 and still doesn't understand that if you don't work hard, you don't get anywhere. You know? His, his, his Instagram handlers is a chef son. So, but very smart, extremely smart and very talented, but I, go, I show up at 9 o'clock at work, you know, in the morning, not at night. And that's it. So this is, uh, this is ultimately uh, my path. That's what I love. I, I mentorship lots of people. I got, uh, I did another dinner before Sherbrooke. I did another dinner in Mexico with a one-star uh, Michelin star chef. And um, it was an amazing uh, experience because in a, in a world where it's been dominated for male figure for a long time, there is a lot of females that are coming up. And I'm very, very honestly and genuinely happy. Uh, there are some very strong uh, candidates in my kitchen that uh, they are coming up. And 46% in this resort, worldwide resort recognized, 46% were women in a very good position. The general manager was a woman. Uh, the head sommelier was a woman in very strategic, important roles. So, very good. You want to say anything, Gurjot? It's better you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Have you experienced the, um, the, the food arena? Is there any sort of, is there a technical difference? <laughs> Yeah, pickled. Think about it. Uh, the pickling part, it's not only for flavor, but to help to cleanse the palate and eliminate some of the fatness, the saltiness. You know what I'm saying? Of course, it has to be a gentle pickling, not a very strong pickling. But yes, you, you can use even, even grilled asparagus, even grilled mushrooms. Nobody, nobody it's, it's your call. Uh, dry fruit, going from uh, dry nuts to even um, other kind of fruit, like dry figs and apricots, uh, sultana raisins, is not a problem. You know what I do in my restaurant on the cheese plate? I incorporate all those dry ingredients, no nuts, because in the restaurant it's very difficult for cross-contamination with the allergies that there are. So I had a party, uh, when was uh, Friday night? Friday night, out of 14 people, uh, nine, they had different allergies. <laughs> and we had 150 reservations, so, and you have to handle it, right? So uh, this way you eliminate some of the, but you can do it at home. So I make a fruit bread, a fruit bread that is amazing, and it, it goes well, because a fruit bread gives that sweetness. You know, it's like making a milk bread with fruit inside that eliminates some of the salt, because Let's be very honest. We cannot eat this every day. <laughs> I don't eat it every day. I'd be very honest. But today I had a prosciutto sandwich. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, there is a guy, there is a chef, there is a... I thought he was my friend until, <laughs> until, until about two months ago. He came and he brought me those truffles. And I test them and I told him exactly the test, like the truffles. So he doesn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> but I love him. Uh, I don't preclude myself I've just finished telling you that I use Australian truffles, but they are very good. So my standards are very high. My standards are my standards, and your standards are, have to be yours. So they smell like bad truffles. <laughs> yes. I have a question from one of our YouTube viewers. Yes. So 
That's a great, great question. So I worked in Spain. One of the favorite way to, to do the wine pairing, it's actually sherry, dry sherry. Marsala, Marsala Superiore, which is a type of Marsala from, from Sicily that is not too sweet, it will be indicated. I personally, and many other uh, professionals, sommelier agreed, I like sparkling and white wine with, uh, red wine goes with every, everything, but red wine has almost, it's pretty much like when people have cheese and red wine. They don't actually complement to each other, but they actually kill each other. They, so you don't, you know what I'm saying? No, I already told uh, Shannon, I said, white wine, honestly, Pinot Grigio, it would be a great choice, or a nice dry Prosecco, really good. Yes. Talk about that too much. Yes. Yes. Um, the quality. How is one layman to know a better balsamic than another? Okay. Okay. That's a great question, and I'm glad you asked. But I, I didn't want to talk about balsamic vinegar. Uh, balsamic vinegar is a very amiable vinegar because of the sweetness. And very often, we are misusing it. Uh, as I was mentioning, few drops of good balsamico then makes the whole game. But making a salad with balsamic vinegar, now there is all those reduction and crema and this and that. They can find an allocation in the kitchen, but not to be used too much. So it's very important that Balsamic vinegar, you should be read, that is made in Modena province or Emilia-Romagna province. And it has either the DOP or the IGP denomination. They guarantee certain standards. Then there, ir, there are very different, you know, stages, because depending how long, you know, the way they do, they use four to five different kind of uh, vats, uh, wooden uh, vectors that they put in and they change it until they can be as old as 100 years. And they, they can cost 200 milliliters, $300. So there is a difference between balsamico and balsamico. The best part is, even if you want to buy, the reason why I choose this, it's not very expensive. If you go to Nicastro, um, La Bottega di Nicastro is not very expensive. I picked this one, but it's very good. Really, really good. Uh, otherwise, I could have brought the one that you use, you know, the, the drop things. But, you know, those, they have an application. When I do very special dinners uh, where money is not an object, then I pull it out of the, of the safe. <laughs> yes? dips, like I know I'm not going to say hummus, tzatziki, or baba ganoush, but what would be Italian, what would you have oh, I mean, uh, uh, yesterday, yesterday at the airport, airport, I eat uh, uh, what was it? hummus, right? In my restaurant, I serve with bread, because I, I believe, I hate, re don't you hate restaurants where you have to buy the bread? Yes. 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 Let's, let's, let's do a movement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I serve I serve sourdough in my restaurant, uh, organic, and I serve chickpea puree. I don't call it hummus because I don't put tahini. And what I do, because I worked in Tuscany, chickpea they are used a lot. I use dried chickpea. I soak them the night before with baking soda. Then what I do, I boil them once to eliminate some of the gas, strain it, put cold water, and finish it, and then I put an infused oil, no raw garlic, just infused oil with garlic and herbs, strained inside, and that's what we've been serving for the last 23 years in my restaurant. Uh, you, you can, but the problem is when you start to have dips, you have to incorporate much more elements, garlic, 
onions takes away all the flavor. That's the only reason. You need something that complements, not something. You see, red wine does not complement. Red wine eliminates and makes null. So the same thing with all these. Yes. Yes. Uh, do you ever make your own infused olive oils to go with the dishes with herbs such as rosemary, garlic, thyme? Okay. Never. Never. Sorry, can you just repeat the question so they know what I asked? Okay. okay. So, so I've been asking if I use olive oils. Infused olive oils. Infused olive oils. They are counterproductive for two reasons. If they are done in cold infusion, they can be a growth of bacteria, and people don't think about it. And if they are done warm, then we change the organolytic properties of the oils. Olive oil is great because it's healthy. Olive oil is great because the guy went to pick up the olives on the tree to have as low acidity. When you heat it up, you bring up the acidity of the oil. There are so many different oils that I use to infuse that they are very good and they're and they actually better to carry the flavors. When you have a very good, strong, remarked olive oil, unless you put a strong spice like rosemary, it's very hard to infuse and it takes a long time. But if you take, let's say, grape seed oil, very healthy, I do an infusion of grape seed oil with coffee that I serve with fish in my restaurant that is amazing. Really, really amazing. I do vanilla. Which other olive oil infuser I'm making lately? Herb oil. So when I have, try at home, this, I give you this recipe, it's very simple. Combination of herbs and uh, even some lettuces that they are getting uh, tired, okay? So what do you do? You blanch them and then uh, you refresh them in ice bath, you shock them in ice bath, you chop them and you put them in the blender with grapeseed oil. Then you take this combination and you heat it up at 100 degrees for about five minutes. You strain this oil through a cheesecloth, you will have the most amazing green oil with flavor that you ever had. Try it and see if I'm lying. <laughs> My name is Pino, not Pinocchio, eh? <laughs> yes. They will get too soggy. The strawberry marinated overnight, you have to use, it would be great if you w use green strawberries, but ripe strawberries, then they will be too mushy. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes, senor. I didn't say the name of my restaurant. <laughs> it's very kind of you. I'm not here to do promotion. It's called Chopinos. Chopinos, uh, it's a play on word. Uh, when uh, my financial partner uh, gave me the money to, to build this restaurant 25 years ago, he wanted to call it Pinos. And it sounds bad. I, I says, why don't we call it Chopinos? Chopinos, it's a play on word. It can be Chepino, Chao Pino, uh, Chepino. But Chopinos, everybody thinks is a fish stew originated in, in Italy, but it's actually no. It's a fish stew that originated in San Francisco. And the etymology uh, derives from the Italian accent of the fishermen that they used to go out and do the catch of the fish in the San Francisco Bay, and they used to come back and chip in for a communal dish of fish. And chip in with my accent becomes chopin. <laughs> so that's a true story. 
Well, it's been truly a pleasure. Thanks for taking time on a Sunday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, again, thank you to Todd and Shannon to put up with me. Well, I'm a very demanding guy, so I apologize. You can tell I'm... That's why my wife say, go, go. <laughs> anyway, thanks again. Thank you. Can we? Oh, there we go. Thank you, Chef Pino. That was absolutely amazing. Don't we agree, everyone? I think he needs another round. Wow. Just so everybody knows, I know that was a lot of information. So this has been recorded. It's been running live on YouTube, actually. Shout out to all our YouTube and Facebook viewers. Thank you for your questions. So you can always go back and watch the replay. I know I certainly am, because I did not catch all of that information. And I'm going to make my husband watch it, too, because he's the one who does all our cooking. So um, all right, I've got a few things I want to say. By the way, my name is Lydia DiFrancesco. I'm the co-chair of Italian Week Festival. So. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank Pino again and his assistant for coming all the way from Vancouver. It was a very long flight, I'm sure, and they're flying again tomorrow morning, um, so we really appreciate the effort. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Italian Embassy for their support for this event. Uh, it's very much appreciated. And all of you for coming. This is a sold-out event. All of our master classes have been sold out. We're so thankful for you. And I have some exciting news. You get to bring all this food home with you and the charcuterie board. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so we have some bags at the back. So if you guys need some bags to take your stuff home with you, um, though you can get them on your way out. We do have a short little meet and greet after. So if you'd like to stick around, chat amongst yourselves, chat with Chef Pino, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. You what, sorry? Our official photographer, Finn, shout out to Finn, he will gladly take a photo of you and Chef Pino if you like, so you're welcome to come up. We can have a little like photo reception line. Um, and if you have not registered for our focaccia class or the wine class, they are sold out for in-person, however, you can watch them online live. It's gonna be the same format, 7 p.m. Tuesday and Thursday, so you can catch that on our YouTube and Facebook channels. And lastly, I invite you to join us on Grand Finale Weekend, which is this Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday on Preston Street here. We have a ton of activities, a lot of performances. Check out our website, italianweekottawa.ca, for all the details. And thank you once again for coming. Have a great evening.